say, God bless you, Cindy. I tell you what, I appreciate her. You know, during this time of loss, and she just she in, she just was a, an example of someone who just keeps going and who stands strong. And I appreciate so much her uh, her life and her uh, dedication to God. And uh, we really appreciate her and Chad. Uh, both both of them and their family mean a lot to this church and we are we're so thankful and blessed to have them to be with us uh, we are we're grateful for what God is doing and God is doing in this this church I had something to happen Wednesday uh, that was such a blessing to me I really thank God uh, I had stood to to bring the message, and uh, for some reason I didn't have my hand mic. I had only the pulpit mic. But Sunday, you know, we had a baptismal service, and we moved this the pulpit. And so, in my dream, in fact, I was I was in the office, and I was kneeling at my chair, uh, and I went off to sleep. And that was Wednesday afternoon, and God gave me a beautiful dream. And as I was as I was dreaming, I was standing behind the pulpit getting ready to preach, and Sissy was sitting right where she's sitting. There was a lady sitting beside her, and I don't know who she was. Um, I, I can tell you what she looks like right down to the, I mean, everything about it, the glasses she wore, all of it. But as I started to preach, she said, I need to say something. And so she, uh, uh, she started uh, and I, I gave her permission, and reluctantly at first, but then there was something about it, something about her presence. And as she did so, this mic wasn't working, so I knelt here to plug the mic up. And whoever that lady was that was sitting by Sissy, as she began to speak, she only had about two words out of her mouth when the Holy Spirit just swept through this congregation. The power of God is so powerful, I don't think I've ever felt anything any greater, any stronger in my life. And as I was kneeling there, the Holy Spirit came all over me. And I began to glorify God in the heavenly language. And the spirit power of God moved across this congregation. And I felt something happen that was beyond anything that I have ever seen or felt in this church. And I know it was God. And God was letting me know that he's getting ready to do something powerful. And I, I come to you this morning, and I want to talk about every time that there is a, a need or a problem, that God is the God of miracles. Days of miracles are not past. This is a day of miracles. We're seeing some phenomenal things happening around our world. We're sort of isolated and not seeing a lot of it here in the Ozarks, but I'm telling you, God is up to something in this last hour and in this last day. So I'm asking you to look for one thing from every service henceforth in this building will be a move of God, a revival type atmosphere. And I want to, I'm telling you, there is something happening. And God is moving. I want you to take your Bibles, if you would, this morning as we talk about miracles. And as we are talking about them both in the a.m. and the p.m. service, I want you to hear what the Spirit would say to us. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 14. This is one of those, one of those uh, great words and miracles of the Bible when you think about great miracles you got to think about this. Now, I want to tell you something. As you're turning there to that 14th chapter, beginning 13th verse, while you, when we get to heaven, and all of us are enjoying our, the presence of God and the presence of the Lord and our time together, and then I don't know exactly how we will do and how we will disperse and do a, go about eternity. I don't know how all that's going to work. But I know that there are a lot of people that you probably want to see when you get to heaven. I know you want to see your loved ones. 
We talk about that. Sydney talked about this morning her mother passing away this week and the day that she can stroll down Heaven's Avenue and, and make reconnection with her mother. Others of you are looking forward to that time of reunion. Then perhaps you've got your favorite people in the Bible that you want to go and you want to spend some time with. You just want to meet them. And while you're standing in line to talk with the Apostle Paul, and some of you perhaps want to talk to Jonah and how the experience in the whale and or in the in the fish that God had prepared, and others of you want to talk about John and talk to John the Baptist, what an experience he had on the Isle of Patmos when he received the vision from God. All of you might be busy about that, and you, you're, you're standing in line waiting your turn to get to see and to talk to these great heroes. I'm going to go and talk to one of my heroes. I don't know what his name is. I'm going to give him a name. I'm going to call him Bobby because the Bible doesn't give him a name. But while all of you are talking to them, I want to talk to this boy. I want to talk to the boy that gave up his lunch to see the multitude fed with the lunch that he had prepared. Because somehow, I don't know what his whole life was like after that day, but I don't think it was ever the same. And so we're going to just take an adventure together with Bobby, and we're going to hear his tale of what happened on this great day. You see, it started out, and the Word says in beginning with the 13th verse, when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, the disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. You feed them. And, and they said unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples. And they and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up the fragments that remained, twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten, listen to this, and they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. I want you to notice the transition from the multitude to the solitude. From the masses to the minority. To the great crowds until Jesus was all alone. In the process of this is the is the very picture of miracles and how God operates in miracles. We, we have a lot today about miracles, and we hear about it all over the world. But here I'm going to talk about this participation of people in a miracle. You see, other, trans, other scriptures give us the fact that it was a little boy who brought his lunch that day. And he, he had, of the only people there in this desert region, he was the only one with a meal. 
But I want to talk about the fact that there was a need. The disciples recognized the need. It was a problem. The people were hungry. The day was long. They had ran after Jesus. Many of them were tired. He performed miracles. He healed them. But now the day was, was passing rapidly, and the disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, we got a problem. We got a problem. We got a multitude here, and they're hungry. We're enjoying your ministry. You see, they interrupted Jesus right in the middle of his ministry to these people. They came and said, Jesus, we got a, we got a situation on our hand. So there were 5,000 men beside the women and children. So there's a possibility of fifteen to 20,000 at the minimum that was in this congregation of folks that day. When there's a need, here's my beginning point, and it's on the board. When there is a need and all understand their part, and respond accordingly by giving their all, regardless of the odds, then God can work a miracle. Now, I want to break this down to you, but I just wanted to give it to you in a whole. Because any time that there is a need because there's a problem, and any time that there is a problem if you will understand that God's desire is to perform and to work a miracle. But there has to be, first of all, an understanding that with those needs, there must be your part and my part in the answering of those problems and the workings of the miracle. And how is it? It is because we're willing to do our part by giving our all, regardless of the odds, and trusting God. I want to take six points, and I want to give these to you this morning. And then tonight we're going to talk about following God on further, going beyond that we've ever gone before. But in this message this morning, there are six points. The first point I want to bring to you is all miracles began with a problem. There has to be a problem in order for there to be a miracle. Our Sunday school teacher asked us earlier today, how many of you have got a problem or had a problem? And almost every hand, some there was, there was one of our gentlemen that, that raised both of his hand. I happened to be coming out of the study, when I heard him ask the problem, if you've got, have, how many has ever had a, a problem or a situation? And I raised both of my hands and one of my legs, and I couldn't raise the other one because I'd fall. But we know what problems are. We know what problems are as a church. We know what problems are as families. Now let me ask you again, how many of you, have a problem or have had a problem in your lifetime? How many of you have problems right now? All right, that's almost everybody. Now, we're going to change the order of this service today. Instead of asking folks to come forward and be prayed for that have problems, we're going to ask those who don't have problems to come to be prayed for. And you say, well, why are we going to pray for those that don't have problems? Because they don't have miracles coming. And so if they are going to have a miracle in their life, they need a problem. And so what we're going to do is have them come forward, and we're going to pray for them that God will give them a problem. <laughs> but what we really understand, that this covers almost everybody, and certainly it covers our church. We have situations and problems, but we've got a problem-solving God. We have a glorious God who is able to meet. He's able to go exceedingly and abundantly above even what we can think to ask Him. All miracles began with a problem. 
Number two, the first thing we have to do after we understand that we have a problem, it may be a physical problem, that you need a miracle physically. Here we have a problem. The disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, these people are hungry. And the best thing that we figured it out, we're going to give you, we're going to give you a suggestion, Jesus. Our suggestion to you is that we've talked it over and we think we've got the answer. How many of you ever go before God with your problems and let him know that you got the answer for it? He just needs to do what you, you know what's best. Come on. But you know, I find out that every time I try to go God, to God with my problems and I try to tell him what I need, he don't listen to me. Amen. I think our Sunday school teacher said it best that we have a we have a vision about this big and God's got a vision so big that we 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 think we can bring to God our problems but we have to understand we need to place the problem in its proper place. Now place the problem in its proper place. Now now what I'm talking about is that if you've got a problem in your life, it may be a financial problem. These folks had, had a need that they were hungry, and the disciples had the answer, send them away. Let them go on home. Let them go buy food. Let everyone take care of themselves. <laughs> they weren't expecting what Jesus was about to tell them. Jesus said, no, you, you feed them. Don't you know that every one of those disciples backed away and said, why did we open our big mouth? We could have just left it alone. But now it's our problem. But you see what Jesus was doing, he was properly placing the problem. He wasn't just talking about it. Now it has to be placed. And when we have a problem, we got to properly place the problem. Where is it? What did we do? Most people want to hide and just say, God, you take care of it. I don't know what to do. I'm just, I'm out of it. And that's how we do with problems with churches. We just say, okay, God, we just you, you take care of it. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to take me a vacation while I'm gone. Please take care of this problem. Or we have problems in our, 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 our business or whatever else we're involved in, and we just sort of want to leave God to take care of it for us, and then we reap the benefits of saying, I've heard folks all the time, this is one of the big things we tell people, turn it over to God and leave it alone. But properly placing the problem is that God's not going to take it if you don't come with it. In other words, our main thing is, well, it's out of my hands. Well, this is what the disciples were saying. It's out of our hands. But then God says, no, 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 no. If you want the miracle, you participate in the miracle. Placing the problem in its proper place. What are those? There are three things that I wrote down about the proper place of putting the problem. Number one, problems have purposes. Problems have purpose. There is nothing that will ever happen in your life that God does not have a purpose for that for some reason. If we've got problems as a church, then it is a purposed problem. Somebody said, well, the devil is really working hard. This is God's church. It's not the devil's church. Come on now. Oh, I know he fights against us. I know he'll come against us. But problems are for a purpose. We can either put them in their proper place. We can give up. We can all get decide that it's too much. It's too hard. I can't take it. Or else we can stand and say, if there is a problem, then God is the solution. And I'm with him. And whatever it takes, I'm with this. Putting the problem in its proper places is to understand there's purpose. How many of you get discouraged with your problems? How many of you get, get to the point that you say, I just don't, I can't do it. I don't know what to do. You see, what you've got to do is to realize, when you realize, okay, there's a problem. 
what's going to be the purpose of this problem. When the disciples came to Jesus, the big problem was you got 15 to 20,000 people hungry and nothing to eat. They'd already investigated because Jesus said, you find, find them, find something to eat. They, they went to the treasurer and they said, how much money we got? And the treasurer said, we, we got some money, but what we have won't even start to feed this group. I mean, we might be able to feed the disciples, but that's about as far as we could. If we're going to have a meal, we probably have enough to go to McDonald's and buy a few quarter pounders with cheese. And some of us can get some fries, but that's about it. But Jesus said, no, bring me what you got. Man, I want to tell you something. Whoa, you're talking about it, putting problems in its proper place. It's whenever you realize, God, here's my limitation, but you've got it. So the problem placed in its proper place, that's first. Then problems have potentials. That's number two. Problems have potential. With every problem, there is the seed of possibilities of some tremendous things happening. You put it in its right place, a seed planted is going to produce more than the seed. And if we place it in God's hand and have the faith of God, that's why when I look with a vision over this congregation this morning, I realize we have problems, but I believe that there is potential of the greatest move of God this church has ever experienced in its life. I've got problems in my life, but I'm putting my problem in its proper place, and that is to believe that it's going to bring the greatest potential of ministry that I've ever known in my entire life. It's going to go beyond the secular realm of my working. It's going to go beyond the, the fact that I stand before you and I minister to you. It's going to go beyond the, the airways and into, the, into the, uh, the lives of people outside of this church. There are people that will be listening to this message all over the world and I believe with all of my heart that God's going to touch and bring about results of this because it comes out of a problem. I wish I had somebody this morning that would take the time to praise God for the problem. You say how in the world can I praise him for it? Because it holds so much potential of what God's going to do. Look around you and see the need and understand you can get discouraged but you can put the problem in its proper place and say there is a reason because God's got something coming. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise Him in this house this morning. The third thing is problems produces praise. But the praise doesn't come after the problem is resolved. The praise comes before the solution. You see, we give him praise. That's why the Bible says in all things, give thanks. Is problems a thing? Do we give thanks in the midst of the problem? You see, you're putting the problem in its proper place. You're saying, thank God we've got something to work with. Thank God we're not sailing on smooth uh, seas. Thank God it's not easy. Thank God it's an uphill climb. Thank God for the mountain because as soon as I get that to the edge of that mountain, I know ascending to the top of it is going to be the glory of the presence of God. And I'm telling you right now that out of this church, God is going to produce the greatest miracles you've ever seen because we're placing our problems in the hands of the almighty God who is able to do. How many of you know this morning, he's a great, big, miracle-working God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Number three, number three, not only our miracles all begin with a problem, we must place those problems in their proper place but all must understand their part. All must understand their part. You see, my part is this. Look at me. 
understanding my part, first of all, most of the problems we create ourselves. Can I get an amen from somebody that would be honest? Usually our problems come from our stupidity. Just messing up. Just doing wrong. Just not doing what we know is right. So when we first of all understand our part is to admit, Lord, you know where our main problems come from? It comes because we are prayerless. We do not pray and seek God. We have created a lot of our problems. Any problem that you might have, you can usually run back a source and find it to be a human that's created that problem. Amen? Even in your sicknesses, even in, your, in, in, in diseases or sicknesses that have attacked your body, if you run it back and realize it could have been your, your diet that caused you the physical problems. Now nobody's saying amen at all. It could be because that you weren't very good at keeping your money and in doing the right thing with it is why you've got a financial problem. It's not the lack of money. It's the sources not being properly used. If you've got problems in your life, the first thing you do is to understand what is my part in this. As, as a minister, as one who's blessed to just stand up here and to fulfill a part, my part is very simple, and that is to minister to you. I know somebody could do it better than me, but my part is this, but I must also understand did I fail to carry and preach the right that God wanted me to preach? Where's the problems? I understand my part, not only that I'm a cause of it. You say, well, what about this crowd? Well, the, crowds, the crowd was that they didn't think ahead of time, and they ran after Jesus, and they got there, and they didn't bring anything to eat with them. And the disciples didn't plan this either. And so they had a problem that came up out of this. So with problems... We recognize our part, but if we know that there is a problem, then we also must know the proper response. What's the proper response to a problem? The proper response is to go before God and listen to God. Listen to what he has to say. When the disciples came to Jesus with the problem, they said, Lord, these folks need something to eat. And he said, you feed them. And he said, Lord, we don't have the money. And all we have here is a little boy. He's got, he's, he brought some fish and loaves. Jesus said, bring it to me. Now look at me. That little boy gave up his lunch. This is Bobby. Bobby gave his lunch up. You know, Bobby could have had a friend with him that day. And when he left home, I can see him with his grabbed the sack that his mom had made him a lunch, and she understood Bobby needed something to eat, and she wasn't going to send him out. So she stowed him some fish and a couple of pieces of bread to, in there, and she said, take this with you, Bobby. And he, he knew wherever the crowd was going, the city was going, and he followed them. And, and, and Bobby probably had a little friend, and that little friend may have tagged along, and I, I bet he could smell the fish. And so when they got to where Jesus was and the disciples started looking for food among the people, don't you know his little buddy? Let's call him Eric. Eric said to Bobby, hey, Bobby, they're getting close. They ain't found any food, and they're getting close to us. Don't you think we better go ahead and eat that real quick? <laughs> and Bobby said, well, no, because I'm hungry, and I, I, uh, so, so can you see them as they were there and they're getting disciples getting close? And, and if it had been me, I'd sit on it. I'd hit it. But Bobby, as they got close to him, they saw the little boy, and Bobby held his 
his sack up with the fish and loaves and handed it to the disciples because the disciples said Jesus told us to come get to come get it. And so Bobby handed it to them. And so they run, they go to Jesus. And Jesus helped that little boy's lunch. I want you to look at his eyes as he looks at his lunch. And that's all that's there. And his eyes gets bigger as Jesus starts praying and blessing that. And he thinks, man, I know what's in that bag. And I look at all these old hungry men around here. Besides all the rest of these kids and all these, uh, these women, they're, they're, there's not. But as Jesus blessed it, he told his disciples, he said, now go tell the people to sit down in companies of 50s and 100. And when Jesus got through blessing it, you know, I don't think Bobby was very far away from that bag. As he kept looking, and Jesus opened it up, reached his hand down in there, pulled out some fish and handed it to one of the disciples and reached down and Bobby said, that's it, that's the last one. Jesus reached back in, got some more out, reached back in, got some more out, reached back in and got some more out. And that bag, that bag never got bigger, but the presence of God can flow out of the most smallest area. It doesn't matter the size of your gift. It's giving what you have and participating so that God can work the miracle. And as he watched it, it kept on and kept on and kept on, and there was no ending to it. And when it was all over, everybody there, 15, probably at least 15,000 people, but we'll go what the Word said, it was 5,000 men beside the women and children. But all these folks now were eating. And I can see them sort of apologizing as the disciples went down the row. And he handed, he handed uh, uh, Danny some fish and loaves. And he says, Danny, I'm so sorry, but, you know, the, the, it was, it's just a small bag. And, and just do the best you can with it. And handed some to Chad and some to Don. And by the time that that disciple got around his 50, Don had his hand up. He said, you know, that's one of the best fish I've ever eaten. You got any more of it? And he looks and he says, Jesus, you got, yeah, we got plenty. And so he runs back and gets Don some more. And about that time, Chad says, well, if Don gets some extra, if he gets a second heifen, I want a second heifen too. I need some more of that fish. And so he eats, and, but Danny, Danny sits there, and he's nibbling away, and after a while he says, why am I just going to eat and, and try to make this last? My goodness, I'm, they got a second heifen. I'm going to have to hurry up. And he eats, and then he eats some more, and then he eats some more, and then he eats some more. Because the Bible says they all ate until they all were full. They didn't just get by. They, it, you see, the miracle that God is wanting to do with your problem is not just to get us by. He wants to pour out until everybody has all that they need and all that they want. How many of you would like to see that happen in our church? That God would just pour out, pour out, and pour out. The response, though, is this. You listen to God and you give God what you can participate in the miracle. Because number, number four, respond by giving up even if it costs you your all. Because you've got, I heard, I heard a great preacher, a great preacher make this quote and I want to make it. And, and give it to you. It's not mine, but it was a great word. He said this was what his holiness preacher, daddy preacher, told him many, many times. He would say this to me. Son, without God, we cannot. And without you, God will not. I love that quote. Listen to it again. Without God, we cannot. And without you, God will not. 
God's waiting on you. God's waiting on this church. Do you think that God gets all alarmed? Does he know we've got problems? Let me finish these last two. Number five is you must disregard the odds. You cannot look at how bad it is because when God gets ready to move, he's going to have somebody who's willing to do what he says. Do you remember how Jesus, the first miracle he ever performed, when he turned the water into wine? There were pots there. They were empty pots. Jesus could have worked the miracle of filling those pots with wine, but instead he had some participation. He told them to go fill those pots with water. You see, it's just as easy for God to bring about the wine as it would for to turn the water into wine, but he would not have had the participation. If God is going to work in your life the problems, the miracles that he needs, he needs your participation. You see, well, what do you mean, preacher? Let me give you some examples. Have you got financial needs today? You got a problem with your finances? Then I want to ask you to do what the scripture says. Give. And it shall be given unto you. Huh? Give, and it shall be given unto you. You see, when God gives back, it's a whole lot more than you can give out. If you got a problem, don't hide your head, don't be shameful. But whatever you need to do, you know what? If there is an empty pew by you or an empty seat by you, instead of saying, Oh, look how empty this is. What you could do is say, oh, God, what can I do? And God says, why don't you tell somebody to come sit with you? Boy, y'all got quiet. Oh, you got quiet. You see, when I get down to the, to, the, to the brass tacks and get down to the truth, you say, well, preacher, now you quit preaching and going to meddling, telling me I need to go witness to somebody or invite somebody to church. No, when you sit there and say, God, These pews are empty, and they're not going to fill themselves, or those seats are empty. What do I do in order to solve this problem, God? How can I solve this problem? And God says, you go, and you invite. You speak to somebody. And what happens is when you obey God, then you spoke to one, and 16 come. Like a revival, I held him. Was it Mountain Grove or where it was a cup many, many years ago? That there was there was an elderly man came to church. The little church was just getting it was around this area somewhere, but the little church was just getting off the ground. And they didn't have a lot of people. But one night an elderly man came. And he was he was in his I think his eighties. But he was never known Jesus. But that church loved and reached out to him, and I preached. And that, that, uh, that guy came forward, was saved. And before the week was out, he had his entire family and family's family. And I think there wound up being 17 of those who came out of that one man who gave his heart to Jesus. You see, you never know until you realize that God has a potential. You touch one that God touches a multitude out of the one you touch. But if you sit there and you don't participate and you say, well, God, you got to fill them. Lord, we need folks. We need this. We need that. We need a miracle. God works in divine partnership. Write that down. God works in divine partnership, which means this. You got a problem, get in partnership with God and don't expect God to do it all by himself. He wants you to do your part. Let me finish with this. That little boy, when he goes home that day, he goes in and Mama's in the kitchen, and he walks in the door, and I can hear the screen door slam behind him. 
And he said, Mama, Mama, you, you're not going. She said, she said, Bobby, she said, Bobby, I'm, I, I'm so sorry I didn't send you more with to eat that I just sent. And I saw you took your friend Eric with you. And I know you didn't have enough for you and him both. I'm so sorry. I should have fixed you more. But I was in a hurry this morning, and I felt like you'd be home early. Anyway, he said, Mama, Mama, you need to come in. I need to tell you something. And so she goes in, wipes her hands on her apron. She stands there and looks at Bob, and he's sitting down. And he said, Mama, he said, you're not going to believe what happened today. She said, what was it, Bobby? She said, or he says, I, I gave my... I gave my lunch to Jesus. And Jesus fed 5,000 with it. <clears throat> Mama says, Johnny, I mean, Bobby, we need to talk again. Here you go, lying again, exaggerating. And he said, no, no, Mom. Mom, I'm telling you. Uh, I call Eric. He'll tell you. He'll tell you. And mom says, I don't know what I'm going to do with you, son. I mean, you go off to church, and then you come home lying. I mean, how in the world could that possibly happen? But just about that time, there's a knock on the door. And she goes to the door, and she recognizes that one of them is the disciple of Jesus. And she says, can I help you? And then she looks, and all 12 disciples are there. And, and, and he says, and it's probably Peter. He says, no, ma'am, we've got, we got some food left over from Bobby's lunch, and we just wondered what you want to do with it. She said, what do you mean? And all the disciples step around so she can see, and they all got a basket full of fish and bread, and 12 baskets full. And she sees, she sees what a miracle, what a miracle. You see, God's going to bless you by you doing your part. See, she started it out. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us that that's exactly what happened. But I told you, I just want to, I just want you to see that there, there were 12 baskets full of leftovers. But then conclude this message by saying this, what happens post-miracle. This is extremely important. What happens post-miracle? Read what it says. Right after the miracle took place and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to go get into a ship and to go before him to the other side while he would send the multitude away. They are full now, but why would he send them away? Because what can happen is that you could build your future around the, the miracle of God providing. And that's not what God wants. You see, God quickly dispersed, first of all, the disciples. Go and get out of here. Go and get out. But Jesus right now, man, you're talking about people having faith and people believing. We could, we could double this crowd by next, next week. We, we could have 40,000 people on this seashore. Look what we could do. You're talking about touching the world. Jesus, we need to let... Folks need to know this. And no, Jesus said, get out of here. Get out of here. That's not what I'm here for. And so easy at post-miracles is where most people, a lot of people, a lot of ministries build their ministry on post-miracles. They advertise it. They declare, oh, this miracle took place. You need to come. No. No, Jesus said, I'm your source every day. It's not the person because pretty soon, people would start looking at the person instead of looking at God. But then what did he do? He sent the multitude away, and verse 23 said, And he went, and when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. One of the greatest things that you can do post-miracle is to pray because you'll need prayer more going down the mountain than you ever needed it getting up the mountain. Look at me. I said you'll need a whole lot more prayer going down the mountain than you would getting up the mountain. A lot of people pray their way up to the top of the mountain, but they don't realize if you don't pray and seek God, you'll, get, you'll lose it on the way down. You'll get the devil will turn it. You'll get all crazy, 
every kind of thing will happen. That's what happens to churches. When God begins to bless and God begins to fill the church and things begin to happen, people begin to stop praying. That's why we call for prayer meeting to begin back. Why? Because we need post-miracle praying. Amen. Pray. And Jesus went apart to pray. And when the evening was come, look at these last words, he was there alone. Post-miracle is the time of isolation. Whenever you don't have anybody, that's going to be telling you what you need to do next. God's going to perform some miracles. Tonight is a very special message concerning this. And I want you to hear what God has to say to you. Would you bow your heads, come to the piano, please.